Hello, HG, how are you? Melissa, hello. Hi. Um, well, thank you for joining me today. Um, I just started the recording, so hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Getting Soul Fit podcast. Before I introduce our special guest of the day, I would like to explain how I came to find out who he was. Um, in February 2020, I was coming out of a relationship with someone my therapist believed has NPD or narcissistic personality disorder. Um, during this relationship with that individual, friends kept approaching me with this idea that he was a narcissist by how he treated me and others with seemingly no empathy. And honestly, you guys, prior to encountering this individual, I didn't understand what a narcissist truly was. I started trauma therapy to recover as the relationship was extremely abusive. And today I can say I'm happier than ever, but it has been quite a journey. Um, so part of my healing journey was the knowledge that I gained from listening to HG Tutor's YouTube channel as referred to me by my therapist. So I am super excited to actually have him on my show this morning. Um, so HG, would you mind introducing yourself for the listeners and what have you been diagnosed with according to your doctors? Hello, Melissa. Thank you for inviting me onto your program. I have been diagnosed as having narcissistic personality disorder and also antisocial personality disorder. I write under a pseudonym and create videos under this pseudonym and I consult with various people in order to you know, help them understand what they're dealing with, to help them understand what they need to do, to help them understand more about themselves in terms of what makes them susceptible to the lure of the narcissist, what they're doing wrong, how they can improve their situation. So I have numerous platforms in terms of the YouTube channel, which obviously you found, mm -hmm. my blog, and work from there goes out on Facebook and Twitter, and also Instagram. And I have a range of products in what I call the Knowledge Vault, where you can access that and find out even more about the things that can help you and learn more about the different types of narcissists and so on and so forth. So I've been doing this a number of years and have helped hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people through my books, through the Knowledge Vault, through the articles and videos, and then thousands of people through one-to-one -one sessions. It's amazing. Yes. And you guys, I'm going to be linking um, his information in the podcast show notes along with um, the YouTube and the various sources of information and wealth that you can of knowledge that you can obtain from him. Um, now, HG, there are different types of narcissists, um, and mm -hmm. this is something that I was I had no idea about as well. Um, can you explain the different types of narcissists and their traits, and which type of narcissist are you? Well, I'll start off with what I am. Okay. That's probably the simplest. I'm categorized as the ultra, mm -hmm. which essentially means I am aware of what I am. I'm aware of what I do. I'm calculating, manipulative, have no emotional empathy. And what places me in this category of ultra is the level of awareness that I have. I'm able to disseminate this to people to, so that they understand more about the way that I function and think, but also my insight into the other types of narcissist, which I'm about to tell you about. So the level of insight that I have elevates me into that position. So amongst the various types of narcissists that exist, I divide them into schools and cadres. With the cadres, there is somatic, cerebral, elite, which is a combination of somatic and cerebral, and also victim. They all have various different traits. In Simple terms, somatics are motivated by material things, the image with regard to physical appearance, money, sex. Cerebrals are motivated by the expression of the mind. Either they're exceptionally clever or think that they are. They're interested in the arts, film, literature, theater, crafts. Uh, 
politics, world events, current affairs, that type of thing. They will have an interest in sex, but to a much lesser extent than, say, a somatic narcissist. Somatic and cerebral have a combination called elite. So you have traits of both and generally less strong than the somatic or cerebral of themselves, but you have an amalgam of the two. And then the victim is an individual that often complains, needs mothering, looking after, they have issues with ill health, injury, medication. They might have difficulties with regard to uh, erectile dysfunction, whether it's a male victim narcissist. They have issues with anxiety. They have issues with uh, uh, insomnia. So they're quite pathetic individuals that see themselves as needing a lot of help, but that's justified. So those are the cadres. And essentially, the easiest way to consider those is those are the preferences of the narcissist, okay? Mm. Now, with the schools, there are three main schools, lesser, mid-range, and greater. And then those schools are divided into sub-schools. Greater narcissists know what they are. Lesser and mid-range don't. And within lesser, we have four sub-schools. Lower lesser, middle lesser, upper lesser A, the affable arsehole, as I call them, the upper lesser B, which they are bold, bullying, brash, belligerent. Lessers, it would be too expansive to go into all of the detail about all of the sub-school, but essentially, lessers don't operate with a the facade. They have a lower threshold on their ignited fury. They engage in more obvious behaviours. Lower lesser and middle lesser tend to be pretty useless characters. Lower lessers don't tend to work. They can be in and out of trouble in terms of criminal activity. Middle lessers might work, but they don't have particularly good jobs. Upper lesser A can be quite intelligent, sometimes very intelligent. They often tend to be quite charismatic individuals who are hugely superficial. And they run around with a tremendous amount of energy pursuing the prime aims, which I'll come back to later in terms of what that means. And they're often quite likable, but they're utterly unreliable. So, for instance, you find out that your, your, your wife has left you, so you go and see your friend who's the upper lesser type A, and you're upset, you're going, boo-hoo, my wife has left me. And the upper lesser type A goes, fantastic, we can now go and see the strippers then. Hmm. He's not interested in supporting you. He's not interested in being kind. It's like, good, you've got rid of her, let's go and do something that I enjoy and you can come too. Hmm. Upper lesser type B, they're bullies. So again, they can often be quite successful. They can be charismatic, though not necessarily. They can be intelligent, though not necessarily so. And what they do is they engage in basically saying, you don't like me, F you. It's my way, the highway, it's my business. You don't like the way I'm running it, you're fired. And they're very aggressive. So those are the lessons. They don't have any emotional empathy and they don't have cognitive empathy either. They're like wrecking balls and they're quite amusing in their own way because they're often quite obvious and they just cruise through life in a particular way and you can often see them quite readily. And you often think, who on earth is this person? Can they not see the way that they're going on? It's so blatantly obvious. They're often highly deluded as well. Mid-rangers are more passive aggressive. They engage in covert behaviors. I don't like the term covert narcissist. I find it unhelpful because covert narcissists could cover mid-rangers and also graters and they're, there are substantial differences between those sub-schools. With the mid-range narcissist, they operate facades, but there are different types. So a lower mid-ranger, that is an amalgam of lesser and mid-range, can often be quite aggressive, but also uses silent treatments and cold shoulders as well. They think of themselves as a bit of a rough diamond, who's hard done to, who essentially is a decent person, but can't always cut a break. Sometimes they can be very clever, often they're not. Their facade is intermittent. So what happens is they're like a strip light that keeps flat flashing, keeps flickering on and off. So they are seen by people as, yeah, he's okay, but 
but he has a bit of a temper on him. So that facade isn't always able to keep the behaviours in check. So they do have a bit of a reputation for being argumentative, being a bit of a hothead, and friends and family can often see this alongside intimate partners. The middle mid-rangers are particularly passive aggressive and they split into two categories, A and B. And with A, there's two further subcategories, which are the overwhelming angel. So these are the individuals who really believe they're kind people, but they interfere, they tell people how to lead their lives, they're holier than thou, they're judgmental, they interfere in the way that you could be doing things, but they honestly think that they're doing good. The second type A is basically the anodyne type, where they're a narcissist, but there's nothing particularly striking about them. But they're passive aggressive. They aren't necessarily hugely helpful, but helpful to a degree. So you make a distinction with the overwhelming angel. Middle middle range type B are the crybabies. Lots of pity plays. They think the world is against them and the universe has cursed them. They engage in sympathy symphonies. So with those individuals, they often complain they are, they think they're decent people and they can't understand why people don't like them. They can't understand why people have it in for them. Upper mid rangers are charismatic. They operate with a facade of superiority. And often they have something to back that up as well. So they're often pretty successful, often intelligent, polished, arrogant, haughty, but you often recognize, yeah, he's an arrogant so-and-so, but he is the best at what he does. Mid-range narcissists have no emotional empathy, but they have cognitive empathy. So they know how to behave and they recognize that their behavior can be viewed as problematic, but it's never their fault. It's always something else or somebody else that's caused the problem. Then with the graters, they are aware, they know what they are. They know that they pursue the prime aims. They might not call it that, but they have a similar acknowledgement of that. And then basically you have lower graters who are more your politicians, your military types, your captains of industry. Middle graters tend to be more entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs, performers, entertainers, pop stars, actors, actresses. Remember those categories can fall within the other types of narcissists, but where you're talking about an aware narcissist that's a middle grater, they tend to be, they are, they tend to manifest as pop stars, etc. Your upper graters tend to be more like eminence greases. They move between the lines. They're highly manipulative, not necessarily famous in terms of worldwide fame. They'll be well known within a particular genre or field, and they function by being very much the puppeteers and controllers. Could I ask, Melissa, that you turn down the volume at your end? I can hear myself when I'm talking. Mm. So it's slightly interfering. Let me turn that down. Okay. Is that better? We'll see if that's better. Okay. <laughs> no, I can still hear myself very clearly. As much as I like the sound of my own voice, it's, uh, overlap it's overlapping when I'm talking. I wonder how... Um... Online settings. Okay. I think I got it. Okay. There doesn't seem to be an echo now. Oh, it's, there is, but it's only slides, so I'll, I'll carry on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so those are the different sub-schools of narcissist and the various cadres, and you can learn more about those in my book, Sitting Target. You can also learn more about that from my HG Mall series, which you'll find in the Knowledge Vault, which goes into expansive detail. And of course, as you probably have found yourself, I have various videos which focus on certain aspects of the different sub-schools, the way that they might hoover, the way that they respond to certain situations, the things that they might say, the level of fury that they exhibit, and so on and so forth. So there's a wealth of material that will help people understand more uh, in greater detail above and beyond the overview that I have just provided. That's a lot of information. Thank you. Um, I know mm -hmm. that when I was looking into... Um 
your videos, I was surprised to see so many different types. Um, and I know that's going to help a lot of people. Um, and as you know, the environment um, is oftentimes a primary factor in someone having narcissistic personality disorder. Are you comfortable mm -hmm. explaining your childhood and how, and do you feel that this is like the main reason um, for you becoming a narcissist? Well, narcissism comes from two factors, a genetic predisposition towards that. So in a way being open to becoming a narcissist and it's not a conscious thing, of course. Mm -hmm. And then there has to be a lack of control environment. I often explain it in the context of thinking about baking a cake. So the genetic predisposition is like having the cake ingredients and the lack of control environment is the oven at a particular temperature into which the ingredients go for a particular duration. If you don't have the cake mix, you won't have a cake. If you don't have the oven at the right temperature and the right duration, it won't bake into a cake. So you need those two things. The genetic predisposition might come from a parent. It might come from further back in the lineage, grandparents and so on and so forth. So in some instances, you can have somebody who doesn't have narcissists as parents who could still become a narcissist because they have the genetic predisposition for further back in the lineage and they find themselves exposed to a lack of control environment. What is a lack of control environment? There are lots of different ones. It can be physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, a failure to support the child, neglect as the child fends for his or herself. It can be what I call grade B syndrome, where whatever the child achieves, it's not good enough. You scored two goals, why didn't you score three? got 75% in your examination, why didn't you get 85%? There's always a hill to climb after the hill's been climbed. You can have a situation where the child operates in a gilded environment. They're told they're brilliant, amazing, fantastic at everything they do, but they're not, and they have no control over their decision-making. So there's lots of different lack of control environments. For me, mine was a combination of being subjected to physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and grade B syndrome. I grew up in a household which ostensibly, to anybody looking from the outside, was well off financially. Um, lived in a large house that had access to lots of opportunity and privilege. But behind the uh, closed doors, there was a different story with regard to the way that I was treated by my mother and other members of my family. And so as a consequence of that and the genetic predisposition, which came from my mother, because she's a narcissist, I became a narcissist. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's, that is what I usually hear. Um, and the individual that I have dealt with, um, very similar, sounds very similar. Um, can you explain, okay. cause I hear this a lot and, um, for the listeners that have don't truly understand what this is, what is supply? Well, it's a term I don't like at all. And okay. it's often referred to as narcissistic supply. Mm -hmm. It's an, it's, it's an awful phrase because it doesn't tell you anything. And I'm pleased to see that, for instance, on my channel, fewer and fewer people use it now, probably as a consequence of me berating them for saying, it's an awful phrase, don't use it, and them having greater access to my work. I use the term fuel. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, fuel powers things. So electricity powers your computer. Petrol or gas powers your motor vehicle gas powers your heating system and so fuel which is what i call supply is where you have an emotional response from another person caused by the narcissist so for instance you're giving me fuel when you ask me a question mm. you give me fuel because obviously i can see you on the screen so I can see you listening to what I'm saying and reacting to what I'm saying. So where you smile, where you nod, where you uh, give an indication that you're paying attention to what I'm doing, you're giving me fuel. Now, you and I don't know one another. Mm -hmm. So you're what is known as a tertiary source in my fuel matrix. So the fuel I get from you isn't very potent. Friends, family members and colleagues are secondary sources. There are also... Uh, but they're non-intimate. One can also have intimate secondary sources. For instance, a mistress or somebody you start dating. 
And then you have an intimate partner, primary source. They're top of the tree of fuel. You can also have a non-intimate partner, primary source, which could be a family member or friend, but it's more usual for a narcissist to have an intimate partner, primary source. Now, all of those people, whether they're tertiary, secondary or primary, they will provide fuel to the narcissist. So if you make the narcissist a cup of tea, that provides fuel. If you tell the narcissist, I hate you, you're an asshole, that's fuel. Mm. If you cry because the narcissist hit you, that's fuel. If you say to the narcissist, happy birthday, have a great day, that's fuel. If you have sex with the narcissist and all the ooing and the aahing and touching and so forth, that's fuel. If you give the narcissist a back rub, that's fuel. So fuel can come from the things that you say and the things that you do. And it's broken down into potency, which is linked to your position in the fuel matrix, frequency, which speaks for itself, and amount. If you send fuel in writing, that's the lowest amount of it. If you're stood next to me, providing fuel, that's the largest amount. And then there are differences in between speaking on the telephone, a Skype call, and so on and so forth. So you have those three aspects to it, potency, frequency, and amount. What fuel does is that it allows the narcissist to survive and thrive. It powers the narcissist. At the heart of the narcissist, there is an emptiness. And the receipt of the fuel seeks to fill up that emptiness. So if we imagine where the narcissist is a sort of moderate fuel level, they feel okay. But if that fuel level starts to drop, they start to feel uneasy. There is a sense of anxiety. If it drops lower, there's this sense of considerable unease. Uh, they may find themselves with an impending sense of doom, that like the, that the walls of the earth are falling in on them. And the lower that fuel level drops, the worse that sensation becomes as they experience that emptiness. Now, as they then receive fuel, it's like pouring oil on troubled water. And as they start to feel fueled, the unease and the despair and the doom and the negativity and the anxiety fades away. And as they then get more and more fueled, they start to feel more confident. They, in fact, almost start to fizz with that fuel, that they seem to be coming alive with it. They are bombastic. They feel uh, invincible. They feel like they're a conqueror of worlds, that they're a colossus striding the earth. And so the fuel level is hugely important because it basically keeps the emptiness at bay and then powers the narcissist in terms of causing him to be able to do the things that he needs to do or she needs to do. Alongside that, what the fuel does is it acts as a glue to keep the construct together, which is what is created by the narcissism to show to the outside world so that the narcissist is able to cope with that outside world. So fuel is hugely important. And I have a book that is written about that very topic, and I'd encourage people to read it because you'll find it absolutely fascinating. Wow. Yeah, thank you. It's so essentially it's it's air for a narcissist. It's necessary. Um, what is um, I know and I've heard this term a lot. What is narcissistic rage? OK, so <clears throat> it's important to draw a distinction between anger, mm -hmm. which is an emotion which non narcissists have. And anger can actually be a productive emotion and a justified emotion. So you're a mother and you see your child being bullied by another adult, you become angry and that powers you to run in and punch the aggressor on the nose to save your child from being bullied. Your anger was justified and it propelled you to confront the aggressor. So it served a useful purpose. You might be that you're driving along and your car then goes into the river and you can't get the door open to rescue your child in the bag and you become angry at this situation, the unfairness of it all, and it gives you a sudden burst of strength that allows you to wrench open the door and save your child. Again, your anger has proved useful. So anger 
whilst there are times where it is a destructive emotion, it can also play a part. We don't experience anger. We have what's known as fury, which in a sense is anger 2.0. We have heated fury and cold fury. So heated fury is an explosion of verbal or physical violence, intimidatory behavior, that vitriolic uh, explosion. Cold fury is sulking, not talking to somebody, giving them a silent treatment, glaring at them, cold shoulder. Lesser narcissists tend to use heated fury. Mid-range narcissists tend to use cold fury. Greaters have a mix of both. With that fury, it's always underneath the surface. And different types of narcissists have different levels of control over it. So lessers, they don't have a very high threshold of control. So you see them losing their shit regularly. <laughs> Yeah. Mid-rangers, because of the presence of the facade, they are better at keeping that fury under control. So they don't necessarily explode, but some can where they use heated fury. Although, as I mentioned, they tend to use cold fury more. But even then, you don't necessarily see the cold fury because the necessity of the facade and their higher control threshold means that it takes more of a threat to their need for control before you experience that. Graters have a very high threshold on that um, ignited fury, but it's there beneath the surface. And what it does, it serves a purpose because when the narcissist's sense of control is threatened, the ignited fury will, it will rise to make the narcissist behave in a particular way so they nullify the threat to control. So, for instance, if a narcissist who's of a lesser variety has just lost his job, his fury ignites to cause him to verbally lambast his manager to put that manager in his place and to nullify the threat to control. So it does, it serves a purpose. And that's what the narcissistic fury is. And similarly, I have written a book, funnily enough, called Fury, which goes into even more detail about that, which I'd invite people to access. Wow. Um... Well, can you walk the listeners through the narcissistic abuse cycle and the various stages from like love bombing to devaluation to discarding and reasons why a narcissist would discard? Okay. There are lots of different dynamics. Most people who talk about narcissism have a limited understanding of it and there's many gaps in their knowledge. And what they tend to do is talk about this cycle, love bombing, devaluation and discard. That's just one form of dynamic. There are lots of different ones. So let's take a friend. It's not an intimate relationship. The narcissist can love bomb or seduce that person, not sexually, but seduce them with flattery, being kind to them, being funny, doing things with them to get them under control. The friend is a non-intimate secondary source. A lot of the time, that friend will not experience devaluing behaviours. Why? The opportunity for them to threaten the narcissist's sense of control and thus have to be devalued is limited because the narcissist doesn't spend a lot of time with them. They're a friend that's taken off the shelf and put back on the shelf periodically. Secondly, because there isn't a repeated level of interaction, the friend's fuel doesn't become stale necessitating devaluation. Thirdly, friends often form part of the facade and the narcissism, where it's a facade using narcissist, recognizes that it's better to treat the friend well to maintain that facade. Some friends will be devalued, it does happen, and sometimes a friend will be disengaged from, which is what my preferred term for discard. But generally speaking, the dynamic with a non-intimate secondary source who's a friend or a colleague is the narcissist draws that person in, in effect seduces them, embeds them as a non-intimate secondary source in the fuel matrix, and then treats them to a shelf dynamic, engaging with them and then not engaging with them, engaging with them, not engaging with them. They form part of the facade. They may get what's called a corrective devaluation, which is like a slap on the wrist, but not necessarily so. So that's one particular type of dynamic. With a familial scenario, there is no actual need to seduce because you're already in place by virtue of being a family member. 
Similarly, you can be taken off the shelf and put back on the shelf in the way that a friend or colleague is. Similarly, you can be given corrective devaluations. And this um, disengagement can occur, but again, it's rare. So you have a different dynamic with those non-intimate sources. You have tertiary sources where, for instance, I might go into a restaurant, be served by a waitress who I'm polite to, and I never see her again. So all she got was benign behaviours from me. She wasn't devalued and she wasn't disengaged from because, quite simply, it never got to the stage of anything more than an interim inter uh, an initial interaction between the two of us. So again, a different interaction there again. It might be that I would interact with a waitress and she threatens my sense of control. And so I'm nasty to her. So she does get a devaluation. Or I don't devalue because, again, facade management. But because they're a tertiary source, I may interact with them and never again. Or there could be a tertiary source, a person I buy a newspaper from every day of the week. We don't know one another except on nodding terms. And I always treat that person well. Again, because of the facade, I don't seduce them as such to draw them in because I have no greater use for them than beyond being a tertiary source. And so consequently, that's another type of dynamic. Now, let's look at intimate sources, because this is where there is a greater level of problematic behaviour. One dynamic which nobody else really talks about, and which I have explained, is that of the intimate partner secondary source. So this could be where you're dating a narcissist, or it could be where you're having an affair with a narcissist. An intimate partner secondary source is either shelf variety or dirty little secret of a shelf variety. The dirty little secret is one who has no real access to the world of the narcissist. And the narcissist comes along and picks them up, often at short notice, spends some time with them, pops them back on the shelf, and largely treats them well in the sense that they've seduced them and love-bombed them into the relationship, but they only see them periodically and intermittently, which means their fuel doesn't get stale. They have less opportunity to cause a problem for the narcissist. They, of course, might find being this person that's the dirty little secret who never gets to meet the friends and family of the narcissist, who's always being told, yeah, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. They may find that quite hurtful. But that's not devaluing behaviour. It's basically the shelf dynamic. Now, sometimes that dirty little secret might find themselves being devalued where the narcissist is nasty to them. So she says to the narcissist, I wish I could see a lot more of you. And he turns around and shouts at him. How many effing times have I told you? I'm really busy. Stop putting me under pressure. So his verbal abuse is devaluing behavior. An intimate partner, secondary source of shelf variety that is not a dirty little secret is an individual who gets to know friends and family to some extent. Now, it might be that that's because they're on the way to becoming the primary source, or it might be because that person is having an affair with the narcissist and the narcissist already has a primary source, and they're kept on the outside. Again, they're treated to the shelf dynamic. They're picked up and they're put down as the narcissist sees fit. The narcissist may largely treat them well. They might also get corrective devaluations. So those are many of the different types of dynamic. And then we come to the one which most people think about when they're dealing with narcissists. You have the initial stage of what's called love bombing. That varies in intensity, dependent upon the type of narcissist. And that's where you get what I call the golden period. Everything's wonderful. It's all rainbows and unicorns and glitter. And you're drawn in. Some people get a bronze period. So it's not as glorious as, as a golden period, but nevertheless, you're treated reasonably well. You then become embedded as the intimate partner primary source. So you become the wife, the husband, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the partner. After a period of time, you will be devalued in the same way that we're all going to die and the sun always sets in the West. You will be devalued. Why? Well, in some instances, it's because your fuel has become stale, because you've spent so much time with the narcissist and you're pumping so much fuel out. Or you're still giving really good, potent fuel, but you're not giving it often enough. So it's not seen as stale, 
but you're not giving it as frequently or as in large amounts as the narcissist would require. So again, you're devalued. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you pour loads of fuel, and of course you won't realize you're doing this because nobody recognizes they're dealing with the narcissist the first time around. Mm -hmm. But if you're pouring with fuel for a narcissist, then it will become stale. It's a little bit like being given tubs of strawberry ice cream after a short while, you become sick of it. Or you're not giving as much fuel as frequently you should do, so it doesn't lose its freshness. But because you're not fueling the narcissist as much as you should be doing, that's a problem, so you become devalued. Or you might start to engage in behaviours, although this is less likely, that are problematic for the narcissist, and therefore the narcissist devalues you. So there are three routes to devaluation. Your fuel is stale, your fuel isn't being given often enough or is in large enough amounts, or you're threatening the narcissist's sense of control in some way, invariably inadvertently. When you enter devaluation, when you're the intimate partner primary source, it's what's called the sustained devaluation. Note the contrast with the, other sec with the secondary sources where they had a corrective devaluation, like a slap on the wrist. The sustained devaluation is where the really awful treatment occurs. That varies. For some people, it's being beaten up, being raped, having their money taken, playing mind games, being belittled, invalidated, being triangulated with other people, being locked out of their house, never supported, always put down. There's lots of different ways. And it can include being cheated on. Sometimes you know you're being cheated on. Sometimes you don't, but that's still devaluing behavior. Now, this devaluing behavior in the sustained devaluation continues and then you'll get a respite period which is when the golden period comes back for a short period of time a few hours a day a weekend maybe a couple of weeks on holiday then the sustained devaluation comes again then a respite period then sustained devaluation so that's the roller coaster that people are familiar with this situation will continue until either the victim escapes which is rare or the narcissist disengages and i'll come back to that in a moment or neither of those things happen, and this roller coaster ride continues of sustained devaluation and golden period, respite period, until one of the parties dies. And that's where you have somebody who has a decades long relationship with the narcissist. And it then basically only ends when either the narcissist dies or the victim dies. I don't mean they've killed one another, I just mean that their ill old age comes along. Mm -hmm. Now, with disengagement, there are five triggers. So there are some instances where these triggers are never met. And there are instances where the, not, the victim does not escape. So that means the dynamic trundles on for years, decades. With the disengagement triggers, I have a specific video about this, five reasons why the narcissist leaves you, but they are as follows. One, the narcissist swaps you for somebody that's deemed to be superior to you. And remember, that's from the narcissist's perspective. It doesn't necessarily be, be the case. Two, you've massively wounded the narcissist. Three, you've caused massive exposure of the narcissist. Four, you've ceased to function effectively, i.e. you've had a breakdown or you've become ill. Or five, the narcissist sort of perceives that you're onto them. That doesn't mean that they recognize that you know that they're a narcissist, but rather they identify and detect a shift in your behaviors where you might know what you're dealing with and therefore you've changed your behaviors and a little bit like an army that's invaded a country, that country has an insurgency and is too difficult to keep occupied. And therefore, the narcissist disengages. So those are the five disengagement triggers that can occur. Wow. Um, well, can you walk us through how would you pick and obtain a primary source of fuel? And how do you decide or deem someone a good fuel source or victim, and what are you looking for, and what steps do you take to obtain them as a primary source? Well, to gain a full understanding of this, you can do no better than read my book, Sitting Target, which mm -hmm. explains why the narcissist targets you. But essentially, we're looking for empathic traits. And we want those empathic traits. We also look for uh, special traits that you will have as well. So, for instance, that might be uh, the fact that you were brought up by a narcissist, so that makes you particularly vulnerable. It might be that you've been tenderized by another narcissist before us, makes it easier to control you. 
and we look for the class traits. So recall, Melissa, I was talking about earlier the various cadres, uh, somatic cerebral elite victim. So certain narcissists look for the various class traits of those victims. So we need the empathic traits, class traits, and we need the, and in some instances, the special traits. We want somebody that's got considerable emotional empathy, and we select empaths either instinctively, where an unaware narcissist, or in a calculated fashion, where an aware narcissist, as a consequence of your addiction to the narcissist. Because if you have that addiction, and empaths do, you're easier to get ensnared, and you're easier to keep ensnared, because basically, your addiction causes you to have something called emotional thinking, which is basically, it's not about being hysterical or losing your emotions, but rather you make decisions guided by emotion rather than logic. And it means you don't see the red flags, or if you do, you end up explaining them away as something else. So empathic people have this addiction, which makes them the best targets for us. Not only do you have, um, find that you can be the empath to the fullest extent by coupling with a narcissist you also tend to pour with more fuel and you tend to stay locked into the relationship for longer which means you are a juicier prospect the purpose of a prime sort primary source is this when you go shopping you probably go to one supermarket for the majority of your produce you don't go to 75 different stores. With the primary source, that person is the it, one person to control who provides most of our fuel, most of the character traits, and most of the residual benefits, which are the prime aims. So an analogy would be this. If you're running a business, your turnover is $10 million, you might have one customer who spends $10 million with you. That means you've one CEO to look after. Or you could have 20 CEOs all spending half a million with you. Then you've got a lot more to do because you've got to run around looking after 20 different CEOs rather than one. So it makes more sense to have one CEO to look after in the same way the narcissist has a primary source. Now, there are other people in the fuel matrix that I mentioned earlier on who all contribute to the fuel, the character traits and the residual benefits, but not to the same extent. So for instance, a lesser narcissist their primary source may contribute to 80% of the prime aims and everybody else 20%. Mid-rangers, somewhere in the region of maybe 60 to 70%, greaters 40 to 60%. So you can see that with lesser and mid-range narcissists, the primary source is particularly important. And therefore, we want somebody who not only has lots of fuel, character traits and residual benefits, but they have to be easy to control, bring them under control and keep them under control. And that's why empaths are selected, because the addiction makes them easier to ensnare in the first place and keep ensnared. And so there's lots of different things that we look for which tell us that the person is an empath. But rather than going into the detail of that, that's set out in sitting targets. So I've given you the overview of essentially what we look for, mm -hmm. why we choose empathic people. We can ensnare normal people. We can also ensnare other narcissists. And sometimes you will get a situation where two narcissists come together Dependent on what subschool they are, you could have a greater narcissist controlling a mid-range narcissist that doesn't know that they are one, and the greater can puppet that mid-range narcissist rather effectively. In some instances, you might have two lessers that come together and it's hugely explosive and it doesn't last for long because of their innate need for control and the way that they basically fight with one another. So a narcissist can draw fuel, character traits, residual benefits from empaths, Narcissists, narcissistic people and normals, those are the four classifications of people that I talk about. But we always prefer empaths because you're drawn to us as we're drawn to you. So it's a symbiotic relationship. And as I mentioned, because of your addiction and the emotional thinking, you're easier to get, you're easier to ensnare and you're easier to keep ensnared compared to those of the classes of people. Wow. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. And I, I've witnessed that a lot. Um, and I've heard mm -hmm. of this a lot. Um, and I've also heard of the term, um, and for those that aren't aware of it, what is hoovering? And how long does this typically last? There are lots of different types of hoovers, Melissa. So you might argue, for instance, if I were to come and meet you in a bar and I start to seduce you, 
I'm hoovering you in at the very outset. Mm. And it might be, for instance, that if uh, you and I are dating, when I send you a text message saying, hey, do you fancy going to the cinema? That's me hoovering you to continue dating you. Mm -hmm. So basically, if the narcissist is sat with you watching a film or you're having sex, that's not a hoover because you're both together at the same time. But if a narcissist is getting in touch with you by ringing you up, coming around to see you, waving at you from across the street, sending you a present, wrapping a note around a brick and throwing it through your window, those are different forms of hoovers. Sometimes it can be a hoover putting something on social media that's either sent directly to you or that you might happen to see. So there's lots of different ways we hoover. And we can hoover by proxy, by using other people to do it on our behalf, members of our coterie or lieutenants. So in the traditional sense, hoovering is where the narcissist or you have ended the relationship and the narcissist tries to draw you back in. That's the traditional concept of hoovering. Mm -hmm. And I've explained that actually our hoovering is much more wider than that. So for instance, you can have a preventative hoover, which is where you've indicated to the narcissist you don't want to see them anymore. And the narcissist comes around to see you and starts pleading with you. Please, Melissa, don't end the relationship. I love you. I'll change. The fact that they've come to see you is the hoover because they're trying to assert control over you directly and they are trying to draw fuel from you and they're trying to stop you leaving the relationship. So that's a preventative hoover. You can have follow-up hoovers, which is where the relationship has ended and then the narcissist stands of the blue contacts you. And it isn't always to try and draw you back into the relationship. Sometimes it's just to control you and draw fuel from you. And sometimes the residual benefits. So a narcissist might get in touch with you. Hey, how are you doing? And chats away with you and then asks to borrow money. So they're seeking to assert control over you. They're trying to draw fuel from you by way of your reaction and then trying to get money out of you, which is a residual benefit. You can have benign follow-up hoovers, which is the example I've just given you. You can have malign follow-up hoovers where the narcissist starts telling you that you're a bitch and you're horrible or they start to threaten you or they stand outside your bedroom window making a slitting gesture with their throat or they damage your property. Those are malign hoovers. If they ring you up and leave a voicemail message telling you all disgusting things about you, that's a malign hoover. So there's, lo there's lots of different types of hoovers that occur, but essentially a hoover is a means of directly asserting control over the victim and possibly seeking fuel from them, and possibly getting a residual benefit from them, sometimes trying to resurrect the relationship, but not always. So hoovering is where the narcissist keeps trying to influence you. It might be at the beginning of the relationship. It might be during the relationship where you're not living together. And it's often after the relationship has ended and you perhaps been trying to move on. And the narcissist suddenly comes out of the blue, ringing you up, sending you messages, sending you parcels, sending you gifts, sending somebody to plead their case on your behalf. And I set out lots of these different hoovers in two books black hole and no contact which go into considerable detail about the different types that you experience wow yeah i didn't think of it like during the relationship and in the beginning stages um but for yeah. people in the dating world <laughs> what mm -hmm. are the red flags to watch out for to protect themselves from narcissists and especially as it comes to like online because online dating is um I'm finding the primary mode for dating currently. Okay. Well, I direct people to read my book, Red Flags, mm -hmm. which gives you 50 red flags of seduction that narcissists engage in. When it comes to the online dating environment, my clear advice is don't use it. Mm. I have a specific video that explains why, but I'll break it down. Before I move on to talking about how it's a risk factor vis-a-vis -vis narcissists, quite simply, Human beings are not designed to meet in this way. Mm -hmm. For tens of thousands of years, we have met people in person. We met them on the grasslands in the tribe. We met them in the village. We then met them at the pub, at school, at work, 
at a club or a society or as a neighbor and you physically interacted with that person and then along came technology and now enables us as we are now doing speaking from other sides of the world and of course online dating allows you to find people in lots of different places very easily but it's not a way that us as homo sapiens have developed for the purposes of forming a coherent relationship we're just not used to it and the problem with it is this you can get somebody who's not a narcissist who just wants to go on online dating and because they're a normal they have no emotional empathy for you because you're a stranger and what they do is they just waste your time so they engage in some chit chat they want to get some pictures from you they want a bit of flirtation and they've no intention of meeting you they're not a narcissist but they'll waste your time and they can do it because you're not physically proximate to them you are a stranger furthermore you could get you could engage with somebody send some messages back and forth and you'll get along well and you speak on the phone and you see some pictures and then you go and meet that person and it's the age old oh hang on a second they don't quite look like what they are in their photographs now mm. that might be that of course because everybody likes to make themselves look a bit better they've used some photographs from five years ago but even if they've not done that a photograph's a snapshot and many people and it's not because they're being deceitful they don't look like what they do in their photographs why because when you meet them they're moving they're breathing they're gesticulating and, and the photograph i'm sure you've got photographs of yourself where you kind of look and go i know that's me but i kind of look different there mm -hmm. or friends might say i didn't recognize you at first <laughs> and that's because a photograph is just a snapshot mm -hmm. So they are not being deceitful, but then you think, oh, actually, they don't like, look like what I thought they did. And you're disappointed. They've not done anything wrong, but you're disappointed. Also, when you're interacting with that person online, you don't know what they smell like. You don't know how they move. You don't know if they've got any strange habits of sort of making a clicking noise or, or uh, picking their nose or such things. <laughs> and then you meet them. And then you sort of say, oh, actually, he's way shorter than I thought he was. Or he's a bit awkward moving or, or, or such like. And again, that's a disappointment. They've not misled you. But because you've not met them in the flesh, you've already got a predefined notion of who they are and the reality doesn't match it. You've also then got the problem of this. When you're going on online dating, what are you doing? You're immediately looking for someone that you might have a relationship with. So you go with expectation and high hopes. Most of the time when you meet somebody, you don't immediately think, oh, I could have a relationship with this person. You get to know them. Mm -hmm. And how many times do you hear people say, actually, when we first met, I didn't really like him or her, or I wasn't that impressed, but they grew on me. And that's mm -hmm. the way the long lasting relationship comes about because you get to know that person and you see them when they're tired, you see them when you're up, they're upset, you see them when they're under pressure, you see them when they're funny. You see them when they're not looking at their best. You see them when they're well-groomed. So you get to see all of these facets. Whereas with the person online, you're going there with the expectation of this is going to be, this could be the love of my life. And so is the other person. And that means that you're both going there with heightened expectations, which often might not be met. So you'll notice I've not mentioned anything about narcissism there, but I've given you a plethora of reasons why online dating actually isn't yes. that good. Because online dating isn't about love, it's about money. That's what it's about. It's about the dating platforms making money by providing people with a convenient way that gives you those hits of serotonin. And, the, and there's also, of course, that factor of people go on a date and then they think, well, yeah, that was all right, but I wonder what else is out there. And it's easy to find what else is out there because you just go back to the app. And that actually could mean that you found somebody decent, but you don't give the investment to it that you ought to do because you're thinking there are other opportunities there. Mm. So even if I wasn't talking about narcissism, I would say forget online dating. Mm -hmm. Now, online dating is a hunting ground for my kind. Why? It allows us to access a lot of people from the comfort of our armchair. And narcissism likes to operate on a low economy. It wants the maximum return for the minimum of investment. And therefore, if the narcissist can put in 20 fishing lines into, the, into cyberspace and he sits there and he gets a tug on one, he can deal with that one. And then there's a tug on the other one and he can deal with that one. He's back and forth, back and forth, 
controlling, drawing fuel. Also, the narcissist can pretend to be whatever he wants. He could use old photographs, photographs of somebody else. He could lie about being an airline pilot. How do you know he's not an airline pilot? Well, unless you happen to be one yourself and you ask some specific questions which catch him out, most people operate on trust and therefore won't immediately start questioning that person as their bona fides about what they say that they do. And so what happens is the narcissist is a chameleon. The online environment allows the narcissist to mold into whatever we want in order to portray a particular type of person to you, to draw you in. And then some narcissists will just keep you stringing along, having a virtual relationship with you because that's easy to control you, easy to draw fuel, and they're doing that with you and lots of other people. Others want to get you into that proximate relationship, and therefore they act with undue haste to pull you in. What you need to look for in terms of red flags, excessive flattery, vagueness with responses, undue haste about wanting to meet up with you, pestering you repeatedly with messages, particularly when you've made it clear that you're not going to be around for a period of time, responding in an irate or haughty fashion if they don't hear from you, perhaps being insulting to you where there's no due cause to do so, instances where they are smearing perhaps the ex, instances where they're talking about how hard done to they've been. Those are just some of the um, instances of red flags that you'll find online. I have a video about the online somatic that uh, tells you more about that. You should look, for instance, is this person bragging? Are they boasting? Are they being overly sexual very early on or boundary recognition? You know, mm. asking you for nudes, that type of thing. Have a look at their pictures. Do you, are, are they with people or is it just this one person on their own? You know, showing off the abs or showing off their boobs, you know, in the cleavage shots. Are they mm. posing on top of mountains all the whole time? Uh, of course, people want to put nice pictures up of themselves, but some people will have a, an array of them with other people showing that they've got friends and that they don't have to necessarily be the centre of attention. Um, so there's things like that you can look for. With the online dating also, no, you'll notice that when you meet this individual and they might say, yeah, you know, let's start seeing one another, that they are then present still on the app because they're still looking around. And even though they might have professed to you that they're just interested in you, they're still looking around elsewhere. So there's a host of red flags that you can look for, but the simplest thing to do is don't do online dating. Now, I immediately hear people go, well, HG, how am I meant to meet people? You do it the way that people always have done. Through work, through neighbours, through clubs, through societies, by going out. And people will say, well, you know, I don't have time to do that. You do if you want to make the time for it, you will do. Mm -hmm. And believe me, even though it might be a slower process, it gives you far better opportunity to move things at a pace where you can control things. It gives you the opportunity to assess that person more readily. Doesn't mean you won't meet narcissists, but you'll meet fewer and you have more time to try and avoid them by applying my work because you're meeting them. And you can look, for instance, oh, he's telling me that he's this. I can go and do a few checks to find out whether that's the case. Or, well, he, te he tells me that he's a commercial airline pilot, but he turns up in overalls with paint on. That doesn't match. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bit of a blatant example, but little things like that. And that you also, when you get to know somebody in a particular environment, you probably know other people around them as well. And they might say to you, well, you need to be careful of this person. Or, no, he's a really good egg. And you might see the way that they interact with other people as well. And for instance, if you meet them through work, and I know the workplace has changed where people have to be a little bit more uh, circumspect about their interactions with people. But if you're working with somebody and he works in accounts, you know he works in accounts rather than him telling you that he does something else. So it's far better to start the relationship by meeting in people. And if that means that it takes a bit more effort and you're not perhaps getting the, the involvement with people that you'd like early on, that's far better than being ensnared by my kind. Mm. The online environment, the dating environment, online dating is a hunting ground for us. We love it. It's easy. There's lots of people that we can find and it's swimming with my kind. Wow. Yeah. I've heard that a lot and I've actually encountered that a lot. <laughs> Could not agree yes. more with meeting in person. It does take time. 
Um, Mm -hmm. but it's definitely worth it. Um, and thank you so much HG for your time today and your transparency on this topic. I will leave your links in the show notes for individuals to book both consults with you and to contact Mm -hmm. you and access your books of extensive knowledge. Is there anything else that you would like to comment on or anything that you would like to add for the listeners today? There's a whole range of material about narcissism and the interaction with victims. And if you want to understand whether you're dealing with a narcissist, you can engage my expertise to tell you. Mm -hmm. And I've helped tens of thousands of people through consultation deal with situations with romantic narcissists, narcissists in their family, perhaps extracting a family member who's got ensnared with a romantic narcissist, helping people at work, helping people with litigation, business disputes, child custody disputes, you name it. If it's got a narcissist involved, I've helped people get away from that situation and resolve very difficult situations because I know my kind inside out. If you're listening today and think that you're dealing with a narcissist, do the narc detector to find out whether they are. You see the links that Melissa's just mentioned and consider doing an audio consultation with me. Mm -hmm. Repeatedly, I'm told by people that they wish they'd access my material years ago and that if they'd access my material sooner, it would have saved them thousands of pounds or dollars or euros that they've wasted in therapy. I've often been told I learn more in one hour than I did in Mm -hmm. hours of therapy elsewhere. I'm an expert, and the thing is, because I know my kind inside out, and because I'm a narcissistic psychopath and I am direct and blunt, you will get the answers that you need. I'm not here to mollycoddle or sugarcoat things. I'm there to tell you and jolt you out of your emotional thinking and enable you to understand. And I do this not because I care. I do this because it accords with my prime aims of the creation of a legacy, just in case people were wondering about that. Yes, thank you so much. I'm sure they were. I've wondered about myself. And I can speak from experience (laughs) that your consultation with me definitely um, helped, like, tremendously in my healing journey and it helped me um, cut the cord with that narcissist so I really appreciate you and thank you again for being on the show not at all you're very welcome nice to speak to you Melissa thank you have a good day thank you